This week on Low Budget Binge, look out for Norse Demon Gods, a horror anthology, a driller killer, and all kinds of suspicion and paranoia. Let's get binging. Welcome back to M.L. Miller Frights. I'm M.L. Miller. Before we begin, please do me a favor and punch that like button down below. Share this video with all of your social media addicted pals. Click subscribe to this channel and ring that bell for notifications. Before we get started, I wanted to alert my listeners that I'll be writing and drawing a new short story in Nightmare Theater 2. I thank those of you who picked up the first collection Nightmare Theater, and I believe there are still some copies of that one left where I did a story with superstar artist Carlos Granda. Nightmare Theater 2 is a new anthology that delves into the darkest corners of the mind and beyond. If you have some extra cash, be sure to support the Nightmare Theater 2 Kickstarter and pick yourself up a copy. Look for a link to Nightmare Theater 2's Kickstarter down below before the comments. Low Budget Binge is where we venture down the path less traveled and look at low budget, no budget, and sometimes international films that never get that top billing you see with the usual Hollywood fare. I'll indicate in the review down below where you can find these films along with their trailers. Here we go. Demigod is new on-demand and digital download from Gravitas Ventures. It's directed by Miles Doliak and written by Miles Doliak and Michael Donovan Horn. After her grandfather dies, Robin, played by Rachel Nichols, and her husband, Leo, played by Johannes Miles, moves to Germany's Black Forest to claim her grandfather's house and possibly flip it for profit. Upon their arrival, they meet Arthur, played by writer, director, producer, musician, Miles Doliak, and his daughter, Amalia, played by Rachel Rials. These two are their neighbors who are avid hunters and believers in the legend of horrors lingering in the forest. Although Arthur and his daughter try to warn them, Robin and Leo write them off as loons, but soon they encounter a coven of witches who worship a horned god, played by Chukwuma on Wuchakwa. This coven has been linked with Robin's family for ages, as Robin's grandfather was the person responsible of keeping the tales of the horned god alive, and the witches want Robin to take up that role. There are aspects of Demigod that are very interesting. I like the idea that basically this coven relies on Robin's family as their PR firm, keeping the myths in the public consciousness which fuels their power. I also admire the ambitious designs of the horned hunter god and the witches. Doliak and his crew try to make them distinct and separate characters rather than just a bunch of monsters in tattered robes. I think there's an interesting lore to explore here, but Doliak's story kind of gets lost in it, which deviates from what should have been a compelling story about the lead played by Rachel Nichols' Robin. Unfortunately, Robin's story isn't interesting mainly because I feel the actress, Rachel Nichols, either wasn't really giving her all or simply lacked the range to go to the crazy places the script required. Having seen Nichols act convincingly in other roles, I think she might have been just collecting a paycheck here, recognizing this low budgeter for what it was. The chemistry between Nichols and her co-star, Johann Smiles, isn't convincing, and once things get perilous, Nichols doesn't sell it. So instead of relying on Nichols as the touchstone, the attention is on the inner relations between the coven, which are populated with runway models in hag costumes. I think had some character actors been cast in the roles, these witches could have been much more interesting to get to know. Doliak seems to be going for a witchy Texas Chainsaw family vibe, but it just didn't work for me, even though I'm a sucker for that kind of thing usually. The hunter god himself works at times, though since the rest of the family are human with scars and tatters, I wondered if the hunter was supposed to be an actual supernatural being or just a guy in a weird mask. The reason is that despite the fact that it's heavily shadowed and obviously paying homage to Tim Curry's darkness from Legend, the face of the hunter feels like an ill-fitting mask appliance. So while I know it was supposed to be actual horns on a humanoid god in the story, it just isn't convincing as the seams of the makeup appliances are still hard to hide, even when the skin is dimly lit and covered with shadows. It's an impressive design, but ultimately fails because it doesn't jive with the lighting and editing really well. Doliak is going for an epic story of good versus evil steeped in ancient lore with Demigod. He's shooting for the stars, which I applaud. Doliak is an interesting 
director who seems interested in these types of stories. They've been center stage in his previous two films, The Dinner Party and Hallowed Ground. But Doliak chooses to wear most of the hats in his production, and I feel that it distracts him from making a story that compels investment. It's almost as if important aspects like the likability of character, story cohesion, and pacing are lost as Doliak juggles responsibilities. I think a truly great film is within Doliak's grasp, but Demigod is another miss, sadly. Next up is Knocking. It's new on demand and digital download from Yellow Veil vale Pictures. It's directed by Frida Kempf and written by Emma Brostrom and from a novel by Johan Thiorin. After being released from an extended stay at a mental hospital, Molly, played by Cecilia Miloko, is set up with an apartment and a weekly check-in to see how she's doing. Molly suffered a tragic loss of her partner, which caused her mental break, and while she continues to feel the loss, she's convinced that this is a new start for her. Almost immediately, though, Molly begins to hear knocking on her ceiling that begins increasing in volume and intensity as the nights pass. When the police fail to listen to her, Molly slips on her detective hat and begins investigating her neighbors to see if someone is trapped in one of the apartments above her, or maybe Molly is just not as well as she claims to be. Knocking is a slow movie. I think it would have made for an interesting short film, but extending to feature length is the thing that really killed Knocking for me. There are long moments where we follow Molly through her day-to-day -day routine, interacting with grocery store clerks, florists, her therapist, and making small talk with her neighbors. When the knocking begins chipping away at Molly's mind, these scenes are interesting but grow tiresome because there really isn't much variation to these from one night to the next. It's just knocking. My radiator knocks. My pipes knock sometimes. I'm sure the same thing happens in older apartments like the one Molly is living in all over the place. So having Molly jump to conclusions that there's someone dying in need of help is a pretty large leap in logic right from the offset. While it is tedious to endure, I do commend Miloko for playing a genuinely compelling character. Her panic is directly tied to the way she suddenly lost her partner and her feelings of guilt for not being able to be there for her partner when she needed her the most. So while it is understandable that Molly becomes so invested so quickly, that doesn't make the slow process of Molly going mad any more watchable. But it does make sense in the long run. If there's anything worth recognizing, it's Miloko's performance and the convincingly slow descent into madness. I do feel that there could have been more done to keep the story flowing at a brisker and more interesting pace. Relying solely on a single strong performance is something that often happens in small budget films. It just feels like more should have happened to make the time I spent with knocking more worthwhile. It's well made, well acted, and in the end turns out to be an interesting statement about the quieting of the voices of the mentally ill. Still, I just couldn't help but check my watch over and over to see when this one is going to wrap up. Unless you have the patience muscles of steel, knocking is going to be a rough watch for you. Grave Intentions is new on demand and digital download from Terror Films. It's directed by Brian Risch, Jocelyn Risch, Gabriel Olson, Matthew Richards, Jamie Snyder, Lucas Hassell, and Brian Patrick Lim. It's written by Jocelyn Risch, Gabriel Olson, Matthew Richards, Michael L. Fawcett, Jamie Snyder, Lucas Hassell, Brian Patrick Lynn, and Levi San Luis. Grave Intentions is not as much of an anthology as it is a collection of short films from around the world. It's hosted by a Miss Cleo-style expert in magic and mysticism named Magical Madam Josephine, played by Joy Vanderhoort Cobb, who opines about good and bad intentions being an integral part of all magic, and then in between shorts, she introduces different basic ways of incorporating magic with intention. It's an okay framework for the film, but only adds connective tissue and a few insights about magic. There's nothing necessarily wrong with these segments, but they're pretty cheaply made compared to the budgets and scope of some of the collected shorts. The first of the shorts is one I've seen before starring Donnie Darko's Beth Grant called The Bridge Partner. Grant plays a shy new member of a bridge club who is paired with a well-to-do club member played by Sharon Lawrence. After losing badly, Lawrence is kind to Grant, but ends their meeting with a threat to kill her. This leads to much paranoia from the nervous newcomer. It's all well acted and filmed with an elegance that captures the decadence of suburban Americana, but the story really doesn't lead anywhere and kind of flops over the finish line in the final moments. It's good to see the late great Robert Forster in a small role though. Another familiar short shows up in the second spot, The Disappearance of Willie Bingham. 
It's an Australian short about the titular character, played by Kevin Lee, committing a heinous crime and undergoing a radical punishment program where body parts are taken from him slowly over the course of time. Bingham is forced to go to schools to scare the kids straight, but they don't seem to be getting the message. Still, the scenes of dismemberment are quite grueling. This is one that's going to make your toes curl, though Willie himself can't do so anymore. There is a cold, dark tone to this one, reminiscent of Johnny Get Your Gun, the film that inspired Metallica's One. Jamie Snyder's Violent Florence is a tough one to get through. I'm a lover of cats, especially black cats, and seeing the horror that occur in this short and seeing the horrors that occur in this short are not going to get any fans from the cat lovers. It's the story of a very damaged woman, played by Charlie Thorne, who seemingly saves a cat from kids mistreating it on the street, but once it gets to her warehouse home, the cat's fate goes from bad to worse. I'll admit this is a well-filmed and decently acted short, but the content left me more disturbed than anything. I can take horrifying things happening to humans on film any time of the day, but when the horror involves animals, I'm out. If you feel similarly, you might want to skip this successfully disturbing short. Up next is The Son, The Father, which plays out rather deviously as a twisted mother toys with her son by pretending to be dead when he gets home from school on his birthday. This morbid game really unfolds and unfolds, ending with a shocking revelation. Though there isn't a lot of gore, the mindfuckery going on in this one by Lucas Hassel is top-notch. The ending is especially demented and wraps up the story in a deliciously terrifying fashion. The acting across the board is great too, making this diabolical short one of the strongest of the bunch. Finally, the film wraps up with Marion, a Philippine shorty that also tackles some very bad parenting. A little girl named Marion draws pictures of a dark shape in all of her drawings, though she seems to be very happy with her mother as she tucks her into bed at night. But what's really going on? This one has some intense scenes and a very creepy spectral figure. The CG is decent and meshes well. I like this short but sweet little tale as it proved to be unpredictable and ends on a darkly sweet note. While there are better collections of short films out there, Grave Intentions does have some good ones. Some of the films have been collected in anthology films like this before, others are brand new. While the collective tissue between the tales left me cold, there are some strong short films in this one, and it's worth checking out if you like that sort of thing. Dashcam is new on-demand and digital download from Gravitas Ventures. It's directed and written by Christian Nilsson. News editor and aspiring reporter Jake, played by Eric Talbach, is set to receive official footage from a police officer's dash cam where the officer exchanged gunfire with a former attorney general named Lieberman, played by Larry Fessenden, after a routine traffic stop. Public opinion veers towards conspiracy as Lieberman was outspoken about police violence and other controversial issues. Jake mistakenly receives a set of files indicating that there was, in fact, a cover-up. Tension and paranoia intensifies as it seems Jake is being watched and urged to delete the file and not report it. But Jake continues to seek to put out the truth. Not exactly horror, but Dashcan succeeds at being a delightful venture into conspiracy-laden paranoia. Reminiscent of films like Blowout and The Conversation, there's a lot of attention to the technical aspects of dissecting footage, clearing up audio, and other editing features Jake uses in his day-to-day. Given the fact that his phone is ringing off the hook and a stranger is knocking at his door, it does seem like someone is trying to cover up something and that there's an urgency to make sure that evidence doesn't show up on the morning news. So while the film is mired in the techno stuff, with much screen time dedicated to files being downloaded and multiple windows being opened and closed on Jake's computer, Jake is such an expert in this field that none of the scenes drag as he clicks from one program to the next, revealing a new layer of secrets and lies. It helps that Eric Tabak is a pretty solid actor. There's an intensity to his performance that really sells the feeling of that need to look over one's shoulder. He's slightly acidic and seeping with millennial angst, but still manages to be likable, and, and he'd better be as the film focuses mainly on his face for the entire runtime. It's always great to see Larry Fessenden lending his talents to small roles in indie films. He truly is a touchstone for all things indie horror. His appearance in any film is usually a stamp of quality. Dashcam never reaches the deafening levels of suspicion and paranoia of a Rosemary's Baby or even an Eyes Wide Shut, but it does tell a tense story torn from today's headlines. The manic acting meshes with the rapid-fire work Jake does, making this less of a relaxing movie but an intense one. Sure, the end is rather predictable, but this one had me nervously tapping my foot all the way through.
Finally, there's Slumber Party Massacre. It's new streaming on Sci-Fi and available on demand and digital download from Shout Studios and Blue Ice Productions. It's directed by Danishka Esterhazy and written by Suzanne Keeley. Beginning in 1993, Slumber Party Massacre starts with a group of gals taking a vacation in a cabin in the woods, cooking brownies, having pillow fights, and dancing in their 90s, like you do when you're having a slumber party and about to be massacred. Soon, a driller killer named Russ Thorne, played by Rob Van Vuren, shows up and kills them with the drill. The lone survivor of that night, Trish, played by Masali Baduza, gets out with a hole in her hand and a lot of mental issues. Issues that she carries to this present day where her own daughter, Dana, played by Hannah Gonera, plans a weekend trip with her girlfriends to a remote location for brownies, pillow fights, nighties, yada yada. Through a series of extreme coincidences, the gals end up in the same cabin, and wouldn't you know who comes knocking on the door with a mechanized drill but Russ Thorne, back for more massacring. Slumber Party Massacre is a good, clean, fun film, despite itself. It's definitely self-aware and full of social commentary that is spot on the nose. It's got lines that address toxic masculinity, male gaze, female empowerment, and the whole ball of feministic wax. But just as the original Slumber Party Massacre was written as a feminist reaction to slasher films, this one manages to actually be funny and entertaining. All of the you-go-girl-isms are done with a tongue firmly in cheek. It's as much laughing at the ultra-feminism as it is overpowering masochistic cliches that populate the horror genre. Yes, there are scenes where the male members of the cast bumble around and end up getting killed, but it's done so in such a ridiculous manner that you can't help but laugh. I mean, it's got a male pillow fight in Tidy Whities and two guys named, well, Guy 1 and Guy 2. Details like this will make the most butthurt of anti-feminists crack a smile. It's smart humor. I'm not saying it's genius, but it does laugh at itself and know mostly everything in the film is ridiculous. And the gals in this are ridiculous too. They're supposed to be the most capable of the bunch, but they do some of the stupidest things as well. Writer Suzanne Keeley and director Danishka Esterhazy do something that is almost unheard of in this day and age. They don't play one side against the other in order to make their point. All sides get poked fun at. The girls, who are supposed to be tough and ready for action at any moment, are thrown for a loop once the shit goes down. While they're supposed to be pushing a tough gal who takes no business from a man attitude, some of them melt into a puddle when they see the guys without their shirts. They get distracted and end up being just as much fallible players as the guys are against the unstoppable killer with the drill. And it's downright refreshing to see these directors spread the tragedy and reveal the basic truth that at the end of the day, we're all fucking idiots. Slumber Party Massacre has some surprisingly decent gore. I guess you'd have to with the drill as a main weapon. It's also acted really well with all of the cast displaying some great comic timing. This is a film that heavily relies on the comedy and also relies on everyone to get the stick out of their asses that's been lodged there for the past five years. It's a film that still manages to be pretty thrilling and it's sometimes scary. Rob Van Buren is Rob Van Buren is surprisingly effective as the creeper Russ Thorne, especially when he murmurs in a high voice, I love you. This isn't a film that sets out to save the world. It just takes the status quo of horror films and turns it on its ear and laughs at it. It's not meant to be taken seriously, and those who angrily stand up and applaud this film for being a feminist achievement or boo it for being woke trash are missing the point. Slumber Party Massacre is a silly film that sets out to be fun, and I thought it accomplished that goal with honors. Fans of the Slumber Party Massacre series will have some fun Easter eggs to enjoy. There's a certain guitar that shows up, and there are all kinds of nods to the original. But even though this really is more of a vacation than a slumber party, it's still goofy fun. There are hot gals, buff dudes, lots of gore, and a weirdo with a drill. There's even a cool nail gun scene for you nail gun massacre buffs out there. If you check out your preconceived notions about dueling sides of discourse for the moment, and want to simply watch a fun, popcorny horror film, Slumber Party Massacre should be in your queue immediately. That'll be it for today. Please chime in down below in the comments and let me know how on the nose or mind-numbingly wrong I am, or you can counter with your own review. So guys, you know how YouTube works. I'd love to be able to dedicate more time to this channel. I'm not monetized yet, so if you want to help me out, remember to hit all the pertinent bells and whistles down below. Want some spooky comics to read? I have two new horror comic book trade paperbacks you should look out for. 
Both Grave Trancers and Pirouette, collecting never-before-published issues, can be found in only the finest of comic book shops. If you're looking for written reviews, you can find them on my website, mlmillerwrites.com. If you really want to show your support, I also have a Patreon page, at mlmiller. Look for the link to my Patreon page down below. Thank you so much for your time, and take care. Stuck inside your reality You're doomed Oh, you're doomed You're Yeah.